Hey guys, welcome back to the Farrell's Fit Podcast. Uh, guys, I'm super honored today uh, to have Will Harris on from uh, White Oak Pastures. Uh, Will, welcome. And again, thank you for your time. I know it's precious. I really appreciate you being here. No, thank you for having me. I'm honored to be on your, on your show. Thank you, brother. So for those of you that don't know, uh, Will is the, the owner uh, of White Oak Pastures in Bluffton, uh, South Georgia. Um, one of the biggest, it, Will, is it the biggest regenerative farm in North America? You know, I, I really don't know anybody that keeps those statistics. I, I'm right. sure it's it's one of the bigger ones. I, I have no idea yeah. uh, what the ranking is. But it's pretty big. Um, and what you've, what you've been able to do is basically change the town of Bluffton through through your enterprise, right? Through through this this big regenerative farm, which now you know not only employs a lot of people but supplies a lot of good nutrient uh, dense food to the local community as well as uh, North America on the whole. Um, and you know the audience that that are listening to this podcast, you know, some of them know what regenerative farming is, some of them don't. Some of them don't really understand that the difference between regenerative and commercial farming and why it's you know, so important. So I really want to, um, I really want to start with basically a biography of like how this whole thing started, why you uh, returned it to regenerative farming uh, enterprise. So I know you started that way and then it became more commercial and then you returned to um, regenerative farming. So just for the people that were listening, what's kind of the history of white oak pastures and the kind of evolution of how it all went down? Good, good. Uh, so my great grandfather came here to this farm in 1866, and worked the land all his life. His son worked. His son, who's my grandfather, worked the land all of his life. And during their watch, those two guys watch, and we, which would range from 1866 to about 1945 or so. The farm would have been uh, run in a manner that was very, very focused on the the land, the animals, and the local community, and then not not just for altruistic purposes. You know, the, the 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 land was their savings account. That was the wealth, and the the uh, the animals were the checking account. That was generating cash flow coming and going. And the, the, the local community was their market, and it was the only market they had. You know, this is before uh, air conditioning or refrigeration and uh, uh, internal combustion engines. So it, it, the local market was the market. Yeah. <clears throat> so my dad uh, was born in 1920, took over the farm uh, post-World War II, about 1945. And his generation really revolutionized agriculture. And my dad was part of the leadership in that movement in this part of the world. Yeah. But the change went from what my great-granddad and granddad had done to a very changed agriculture. And the changes were in three areas. And we can go as deep into that as you want to. Industrialized, commoditized, and centralized. And there's a big story behind all three of them. But it was uh, the focus changed completely. Uh, it went uh, uh, to, to fully based on efficiency to create cheap, abundant, safe food. Yeah, and, and it was it was it was a lot to do with the chemicals that were left over from warfare in World War II, right? They wanted something to do with those chemicals, and they well, used the, yes. The, so the 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 whole. Uh, concept of the industrialization came from the technology mm. that had been developed for the war effort, for World War II, and the demand from the war effort. You know, Europe was starving. You know, there was, a, there was a probably probably uh, unprecedented demand for cheap, abundant, safe food, and all this technology. You mentioned the chemicals, and that's right. The first chemical that I first uh, pesticide. We, we were talking about sides. Yes, uh, was uh, that, I, that I that I heard about or know of was uh, 2,4-D a herbicide that came from the tear gas. Mm, yeah. <clears throat> the uh, probably probably one of the biggest ones was the uh, the uh, ammoniated fertilizer, chemical fertilizer. Uh, I think chemical fertilizer was invented in uh, 
maybe Germany, maybe in the 1880s. You can fact check that, but that's close. Yeah. But nobody used it. Farmers didn't use it because it was so expensive. Uh, <clears throat> but the munitions, the, the, the incredible amount of capital put into munitions manufacturing capacity for the war wasn't needed anymore. So it could be repurposed to make mm-hmm. ammoniated fertilizer. And for the first time since it had been invented, 60 years earlier, it was cheap. It was cheap. You know, and, and, and companies uh, began marketing that cheap ammoniated fertilizer and the pesticides to farmers. There were more subtle things. You know, the it was mule farming primarily before World War II. When, those, when my dad's generation went to the European theater and operated tanks, when they got home, they didn't want to plow a mule. They wanted a tractor. So yeah. Like a perfect storm of things that came together and revolutionized agriculture. Do you think? Do you think they knew? Do you think they knew back then the the kind of dangers of it, and they didn't care, or do you think it was just like we need to get as much cheap food as we possibly can, and we know this does the job, so we're going to do it? Do you think it was a conscious decision, or I, I can give you my word that those guys did not know the unintended consequences, right? They were, and the un- unintended consequences were, were horrible, and they fell on the backs of the animals and the environment and the community. But they were they were unnoticed consequences. And you know, the, here it is, eighty years later, and most people still don't acknowledge it. Right. Uh, you know, and and and, and really, until probably the seventies, nobody recognized. It. You know, from the seventies to now, you picked up some steam, but still, still it's not widely, it's not widely, uh, if if there's any acknowledgement, there's not no real appreciation for the damages. Right, right. <clears throat> I, I think you, you almost have this, um, this kind of raising awareness now since like, you know, the Kiss the Ground documentary, you know, certain things have come out where we've talked about topsoil We've talked about, you know, there's only 60 years left of topsoil if we don't make make these changes and so forth. So I, I feel like there's this underlying current of, of awareness growing, and hence why we're talking about this today. But like you said, it's still marginal. It's still very, you know, there's not that many people talking about it, not many people as there should. But I know there are a lot of like stewards like you who are, you know, not only doing the thing, but preaching the thing and trying to trying to raise awareness to other other farmers and other communities and so forth. When you, I was going to say, like when, when you when you speak to other farmers, you know, do you get a lot of resistance, and is that resistance economical or is it educational, or how does it kind of go down? There, there, there is a lot of resistance, understandably. There are a lot of economic drivers for the status quo. You, you understand that that in the big pharma. Big food, big ag, are tri- multi-trillion-dollar industries, and, and this is a lot of money being made from industrial farming, commodity farming, centralized farming, centralized agriculture. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, you've got people who it's it's at the, at the worst possible level. It's it's in their best interest to trick people. Then you've got a much, you know, out here in the, in the field uh, with these farmers, they're not trying to trick anybody. They just, they just, uh, you know, they're farming in a way that they've been farming for three generations now. And they're farming the way big, big ag tells them and big food tells them to farm. They're farming the way that the land grant universities tell them to farm. Yeah. Uh, they, you know, there is national and international competitions on producing yields based on these models that people, seek to uh, gain credibility by winning the yield contest. So, no, these people that I know do not, and do not think they're doing anything wrong. They're, and they're financially invested so heavily in it. That, yeah. that, uh, <clears throat> but, you know, there, there's another side to it. You know, at a higher level, you know, uh, when people started uh, smoking tobacco, which I guess goes back to indigenous people all over the world, nobody nobody knew the unintended negative consequence from it. 
alcohol. Right. And smoking tobacco became a huge industry, big tobacco, right? R.J. Reynolds. And people made a lot, were making a lot of money. And when the the unintended consequence of of cancer and and other things, uh, respiratory disease was discovered, uh, the big tobacco companies knew it before anybody else did. Yeah, and they tried to cover it up, yeah. Yeah. And they can see, and they conceal that information for a long, long time. But ultimately, uh, it became acknowledged that smoking tobacco probably is not the best health, most healthy thing you can do. Right. And that's when huge uh, tobacco payouts were made to states because that that information had been uh, hidden uh, for so long. So I think there are people. They're making a lot of money on food production, industrial food production today, but understand the uh, horribly damaging consequences to the the, the, the the environment, to people's health. And, and so, a lot of people don't understand just how powerful those food companies are. I mean, there's technically four four food companies, I think, that basically run the whole whole show. Well, in, terms of, in terms of meat, in terms of meat, in, in, basically four or five in terms of meat production, probably yeah. four with beef specifically, but even even uh, processed foods, packaged foods. You seen you seen the uh, on the internet the diagrams and the, you know the ten eleven companies and all the brands they own. There's a, a very small number of people feeding all of us. Yes, and we sh- we should not look. To the, the people who are benefiting from that system to say, hey, you know, there's a lot wrong with what we're doing. It's a very damaging system. What right. Are- they're, they're just looking at the bottom line, right? They don't care about nutrients. They don't care about what's going in your body. They only care about the bottom line. And that's the problem with centralized commercial farming as an industry. Yeah, there's an old saying, and I'll misquote here, but it's something like the hardest guy in the world to convince he's doing wrong is the guy that's making his living doing it. So. <laughs> Right. Yeah. And I kind of interrupted you autobiographically, so I apologize for that. But um, was it 1995 where you returned it to uh, regenerative farming? Yeah. So to go back to that, my dad, my dad uh, really entered into that industrialization. He embraced it. and was very good at it. He was financially successful with it. And all I ever wanted to do was run the farm, just like my dad. And uh, and I went to the University of Georgia, major in animal science, not animal husbandry, animal science. <clears throat> and I came back and ran the farm industrially for 20 years and was financially successful, comfortable. You know, we you know, I went back and looked, I never lost money running the farm industrially. I never had a losing year. Every year I paid taxes. <clears throat> so my reason for changing was not financial. But after 20 years of farming in, in very industrially, there's a monoculture of only cattle. Mm. I, uh, I was just increasingly disenchanted with the excesses of that management system. I just didn't, I just didn't like it much anymore. Yeah. I like it. Just, just so people know, I know um, it's obvious to us, but mono, uh, mono agriculture, what does that mean? Like to the to the average person, what does that actually mean in terms of farming? Monocultural production, which is producing one thing, <clears throat> is a hallmark of industrialized agriculture. It is the uh, application of the factory model to the farm. Uh, I don't know how deep in the woods we'll go on that, but in the factory model, the linear factory model, works super well. And then there's a lot of technology in that model. It works super well in terms of efficiency in linear, linear systems. A linear systems like a factory or this computer or your uh, iPhone. <clears throat> uh, the factory model, that linear factory model, does not work as well in living systems that are cyclical. Not linear, cyclical. We can talk about that a lot, but a, a cyclical living system would be like your body or this farm, this ecosystem. And the factory model does not 
apply well. The, uh, the reduction in science gives us technology. Reduction in science works well on complicated systems like the iPhone or the factory, where a lot's going on to make it work. But if one component ceases to operate, it, it doesn't work anymore. You know, what, that one button the guy pushed earlier was keeping this from happening. Right, right. In a complex system like your body or this farm or the ecosystem, there's a lot going on to make it work, just like making your iPhone, a lot going on to make it work. But if one component ceases to operate, things just morph and it, and it works. It still works. Different, but works. So and what when we apply reduction in science technology to a complex system, we get these unintended consequences. Right. You know, the cancer from the tobacco or uh, climate change from uh, carbon, uh, uh, breaking the carbon cycle. You know, on and on, we talk about them all day. So yeah, we'll get, we'll get into that carbon question in a second because it's the big one. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, we won't talk about carbon, but we yeah. we talk about carbon too much. I'll, I'll tell you that in a minute. Go ahead, Reed. No, no, I was just going to say, so with the, um, with the monoagriculture, basically the constant tilling and constant chemical fertilization of the same soil over and over and over again to keep producing this uh, single product is what's basically killing the soil and killing the, you know, long-term kind of killing the planet because... We're stripping the soil of all the nutrients by constantly using chemicals to draw stuff out of it. Is that is that a good summary? Yeah, we're, yes, uh, probably more succinctly put, we're using technology to break the cycles of nature. Got it. No, 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 no organism can break the cycles of nature on its own. We humans, we we, we can't do much to break the cycles of nature without technology. Yeah. The cycle of nature was never broken by wolves or bears or gorillas or you know, we humans, we puny little humans became so good at technology that we could break the cycles of nature. I mean, yeah. So the, the cycles of nature to me, there, there are other, there's a number of ways of looking at it. But to me, that is the, the water cycle, the energy cycle, the microbial cycle, the carbon cycle, the mineral cycle probably some others, <clears throat> and the use of technology like pesticides, tillage, ammonia fertilizer, uh, subtherapeutic antibiotics, steroids, uh, uh, ionospores, breaks those cycles of nature. And when the cycles of nature are broken, the system no longer produces the abundance that it, it's supposed to produce. You know, the all that fossil fuel in the ground, you know, natural gas, oil, coal, that is the abundance that was produced in the era of the dinosaur when all the systems were operating uh, ideally. Right. <clears throat> but we and, 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 and you know, when the Europeans got to this country, the, 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 nothing had been done to really break those cycles of nature. And really, until post World War II, as we discussed. But but since then, we have just in, incredibly broken those cycles. Yeah. And and then the outcome, the and we did that to gain efficiency, they have cheap food. But the food wasn't that cheap. It, the the costs were externalized. You know, if if, uh, if you look at the real cost of food, it's just so so obscenely cheap at the, at the grocery store or the restaurant. It does not take into consideration the fact that we've killed a, a, an area in the Gulf of Mexico that's as big as Massachusetts. Right. What does that cost? That costs society a lot. Yeah. But those of us who kill that zone down there won't be the ones paying for it. And right. the pesticide companies or the pharmaceutical companies or the farms themselves won't pay for it. Society will pay for it. You know, antibiotics are so precious. We, we only got so many. If your baby gets sick and there's one antibiotic, you don't want the pathogens to be resistant to it because we used it in the feedlot. What's, what, what, what's that worth? That's a lie. 
Yeah. Yeah. You know, if you believe in climate change like I do, and you think that's got to do with hurricanes and fires and what does a good hurricane cost? But the cost of the hurricane is not borne by in the food cost that went to create or help create. Yeah. 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 I think most people just don't, they just don't take these things into consideration. They just take everything kind of like at face value and don't look deeper than the, the, the surface level of all these things. And it seems like every time humans have tried to interrupt the like natural cycle of, of nature, we've like, there's been terrible outcomes and we've already, you know, fucked the world in that way. So, um, so we, we humans have so much hubris that we think we can improve on nature. Right. And the right. fact is, nature has been perfecting itself for millions and millions and millions of years. Yeah, yeah. And we can't, we can't really improve on that. We can, uh, we can uh, make something happen or get, gain a want a desired result quicker, easier. But there's an unintended consequence to it. There, there's a payout over there. Yeah, I, I always look at it like. It's always like short-term gain for long-term sacrifice, right? With all these things, we, we make these short-term sacrifices because we want instant results. We want either instant food or instant vaccines or whatever it is. We want to get it now. So we make all these like long-term sacrifices. We don't think about what's going to happen in 20 years, what's going to happen in 50 years, what's going to happen in 80 years. We just think about well, what's going to happen in this next couple of years and how do we how do we make it right? How do we get things better? And People aren't thinking about you know the long-term ramifications of those things, whether it be farming, whatever it is. Well, let's, um, let's, 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 bring, let's bring it home. So you're in the gym business, right? Yes, sir. So uh, steroids. I mean, you could just have an incredibly uh, advanced physique in a short period of time if you take the right cocktail mix of drugs. And and then you you have absolutely one up nature. Yeah. Except your testicles shrivel up. <laughs> so, you know, the unintended consequence may not be, uh, you know, the, the, the perfect, the most perfect system was the one that nature created. Yeah. Not the one that the, chem- not not the, the, chemist, that the chemist or pharmaceutical company created. Yeah. Yeah. We do that in, we've done that in agriculture on a much bigger scale. Well, how, how did you, how did you find out and how did you apply the regenerative model? Like when I spoke to you, know, um, uh, I worked with Carrie, Carrie from uh, Richard's Grass Fed, and she was a, I, I think it's seven generation farmer. And obviously she inherited the farm from her father who similar to your father had gone down the commercial route. And she decided to make that change against like, her dad told her not to do it, said it was financial suicide, all this <laughs> stuff. Um, when you decided to do it, how did you know how to do it? And did you get resistance from, from your family? Was it like a big gamble? And, you know, how, how did that go down? Yeah, I, I had some advantages, and I'm going to tell you about them. But first, let me tell you, congratulations on finding Carrie Richards and Richard Grassley, the fantastic people, great program, wonderful beef. You know, I, I wish there was 10,000 more of them. Yeah, me too. Me too. That, sadly, there's probably not uh, a couple of dozen more of them. But right. she, that's, you got a great one. So my situation was uh, similar to Carrie's, but also different. Uh, similar in that it was a multi-generational family farm and had been successful, and there was assets here. There was no debt. Not you know, nice farm. Yeah, thousand acres of land, no debt, good herd of cattle. Been operating for a long time, was making profits every year, and uh, and truly. Uh, and my reasons for changing was I just I got I I I got uh, again increasingly dissatisfied with that system, and I can talk about that more if you want to. But yeah, uh, like had my from a, moral, from a moral standpoint, right? Yeah, you know. So for me, the the canary in the coal mine was not the environment; it was animal welfare. Right. I, what I had always thought was great animal welfare. I. I in my 40s, what I thought was great animal warfare in my 20s, by the time I got in my 40s, I said, you know, really, this is not too good. Really, it's not. You know, it, yeah, I, I can do it, but sh- should I do it because I can? So, and from animal welfare, uh, it 
turned into the, the, the environmental side, the land, and from there, I mean, the town benefited. Uh, that was different. The first two changes I made, the changes I made with reference to the uh, animals in the land were very, very intentional. I didn't really know what to do. You know, I just knew I didn't like what I was doing. So I started uh, basically giving up things, giving up tools, giving up these, these industrial tools, and then figuring out how to live without them and liking it more and more. Uh, and it was very intentional, and I tried things. Some worked, some didn't. What didn't didn't work, I tried something else, and on and on. And with reference to the town, uh, uh, it was absolutely uh, unintended, and uh, it's like a uh, like an organic thing. When I changed the other, it came along. We can talk more about that in a minute, but that, that's 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 really kind of an amazing part of the story for me. But yeah. I had no, uh, I, I would have argued with you. I can't. This town has been financially increasingly impoverished all my life. I can't turn that around, and I'm, and I'm not a rich man, and I'm not a smart man, and I, you know, I, I, and it's out of my wheelhouse. But when I changed the land and animal management, this town has blossomed. Yeah, and it's nice. It's gone from a ghost town to a little little destination. It's tiny, but it's a little destination. Then. And, 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 but no, but you, you people come stay on the farm, right? And they, they come and they stay with you. And you, it's a bed and breakfast as well. Is that right? We have uh, cabins uh, lodge, for lodging. We got an RV park. We got a campground. We got, yeah, yeah. People, people come, mostly foodies and farmies. And we'll, we'll learn about this. Uh, I mean, we were about four screens open. And I've lost my, 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 my line on who we were going earlier. <laughs> yeah, no, that's all right. That's all right. Um, so we should uh, we should kind of get back to the the carbon oh, question. Yeah. So the the the, the deal about care situation of mine. So, oh yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, my father was an only child, born in 1920. I'm an only child, born in 1954. By the time I took over the farm, my dad had dementia and was out of touch. Yeah. So I. And I was the only one running the farm. I had employees. I was the only one decision maker. So I didn't have to convince anybody but myself. Had he been alive and, and uh, mentally alert, he would not have let me do what I did. Right. Uh, my uh, wife is a, is a saint. She's a school teacher. I've uh, been married to her for 40 something years, but she's never been really active on the farm. If I didn't go home and explain the risk I was taking to her, it would not have been a good deal. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Was, it, and my, ch- my children who work with me now, but at the time were kids. So I didn't have to, I, I just didn't have to convince anybody but myself. And, I, and I, I was easy to convince. What I find fascinating is, you know, you talk about animal welfare and people, people always misjudge farmers, hunters, you know, all these people that really do care about animals and do understand the cycle of nature, but will be the first that they'll criticize farmers and they'll criticize hunters and so forth for offenses against animal welfare. When truly you're the people that really understand it. You're the people that really know about it and, and can comprehend the grand scale of you know, the natural cycle of life and how the animal world really works. Um, and I'm sure from your perspective, that must be really frustrating. Yeah, I, let me explain. Can I explain a little bit more about that to you? Because it took, oh. I, I studied it hard. It took me a long time to figure out. You know, I would have, I would have uh, c- customers say, uh, oh, I love what you're doing here. I think it's great. I love the, to, to come and see what the land and, and the animals look so happy. But there's one thing I just don't understand. I don't understand how you can see a baby calf born and care for it for two years, and then kill it with your own hands and butcher it and eat it. I just don't see how you do that. And and it just, I mean, I wanted to say it doesn't bother me a bit, but that sounds so callous and so flippant, and I'm not callous and flippant. Right. So I said, where is it? Where the hell is the disconnect between this nice person and I'm a nice person? How come? And I... 
I, I figured it out after thinking about it a lot. But the deal is, I think I'm a very simple man. But in terms of my relationship with animals, I'm way more complex than they are. Right. You know, their relationship with animals is limited to their companion animal, the dog or the cat or the bird. That's the only animal relationship that they really are grounded in. For me, my animal relationships are myriad. You know, I got, I've got, I got companion animals. I got a dog named Judge right over there laying down. I feel the same way about they do their companion. Animals. I've also got livestock. Very different. I've also got wildlife. I've got bees. I got microbes in the soil. I got working animals like horses and guardian dogs and herding dogs. My relationship with every one of those animals is different. It's the same way that if you've got, if you've got a mama and a sister and a wife and a girlfriend and a daughter, every one of them you might love, but love differently. So they, they, they do not understand my relationship with my animals because theirs is so narrow. I don't mean that critically. I, I, in right. most places, I'm a simpler person than they are. But right. in that instance, I'm much more complex. And so yeah. I, the nuances of it are not yeah. lost. In I also think people have just become so desensitized to what the reality of food is. Like, so you have two, two camps, right? You have people that just eat meat and they don't really think about where it comes from and they just you know they've never been had to slaughter an animal they've never like butchered an animal they don't really understand it they just eat what's in front of them and they're completely desensitized to the process so they have no comprehension from that standpoint and then you have the other side which is kind of like the vegan vegetarian argument where the whole thing is just cruel um and again it's just it's just like ignorance and a lack of really understanding of the process and then you have um i have a friend juliana She's actually starting a regenerative farm in Idlewild, just starting out. It's like the, they, they bought like 47 acres of land. Um, it was it, uh, after the, the last big fire in Idlewild. They basically bought the land when it was cheap because it was all burnt. And they've been like foresting it and, and trying to like regenerate the land and are getting ready to start like pigs and, and, and so forth. Um, and she's vegan. Uh uh oh, well she's she's actually vegetarian she really eggs but um she doesn't eat uh, any meat at all but she doesn't do that from any kind of um any kind of standpoint of this is wrong this is right it's not a virtuous thing it's just her personal choice like not to eat animals but she understands the cycle she understands nature and she understands that the cows are necessary for the for the soil and everything she understands the whole thing she's educated she's aware She's not virtuous. She just made that choice. So you have these kind of different camps who have their different relationship to meat and, 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 and farming. And it's it's just interesting to me how, you know, the closer you are to the actual thing and the more knowledge you have and the more aware, awareness you have about the whole thing, the just the, the, the just the smarter your relationship is. The more distance you are from the actual process, the dumber you are. So if you have no experience and no education in that field, you really shouldn't be talking about it. You really shouldn't be like, I, I'm not going to talk the way that you talk. I don't have your relationship. I don't have your experience. I've done enough research and spoken to enough people to understand, you know, the necessities, the nuances of it all, but I'm not an expert. And it's always interesting to me how many people think they're an expert and love to talk about this is wrong. This is right. This is, this is abusive. This is not, a, you know, and it's just all, <laughs> it's just an uneducated chatter basically. Um, but people like to have their say, I guess. Well, I think, I think what you said is true in so many areas. You, know, the, you don't know what you don't know. Right. And the, the less you know about something, the more you uh, think it should be simplistic. Right. Because I don't that's, know. That's the thing. People want it to be simple. They want it to be a yes or no, right or wrong thing. And it just, it just doesn't exist that way. And, you know, and the classic example is, of course, the, the farming of vegetarian products and the production of vegetarian products or vegan products and the, you know, the atrocities that go into that, into soy farming, you know, into the, they don't understand the, the amount of animals that are killed in the, in the process of, you know, vegetarian type farming. Um, you know, uh, there's the classic quote, like, it's just, it depends how cute the animal is as to whether you care about it. Right. So if it's, if it's, if it's insects, if it's rabbits, if it's, you know, Mold, moles or foals or whatever it is you know you don't care until it's like an animal that you do like feel some kind of like 
emotional connection to and then you start to care. But so, um, so, so I, you know, <clears throat> for a living, a, a cho- my choice for a living is to raise and kill animals and and and, and monetize my operation by selling the, the meat. That's what I do. And that said, when somebody tells me that they're a vegetarian or vegan, I have full respect for that. Yeah. You know, it's a personal choice. It's like uh, your religion or your uh, sexual orientation or whatever. That's a personal choice. I don't get to vote on your personal choice. Right. And I do have a problem with what I call militant vegetarians and vegans. And the difference in my mind is a vegetarian or vegan wants to choose what they should eat. A militant vegetarian vegan wants to choose what everybody's going to eat. Mm. And that's, that's not okay. Yeah. And, but there's a, yeah, and I, I run into a lot of it because of what I do. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Have you noticed, um, so, so I'm British, as you can probably tell from my accent. I so I, I yeah, I grew I'm up. So, in, I'm, I'm sovereign, if you, if you can tell by my accent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I grew up eating like liver and onions and, and um, more kind of awful. Um, you know, my mother was big into that. And at, at that time in Britain, it was more um, it was more available. You know, we, we used to go to the butchers. It was more of a traditional kind of situation. You know, I mean, supermarkets were around, but my mother would still go to the butchers, still buy like oxtail and tongue and all that good stuff. Have you have you noticed an increase lately in people buying more offal again than they, they did like 10 years ago? Yeah, absolutely. And it is a blessing. Yeah. You know, when I, you know, we, we, we talk a lot about zero waste in our operation. You know, and uh, uh, George Washington Carver was a hero. George Washington Carver is a hero of mine. He said, in nature, there is no waste. It's perfect. It's perfect. Yeah. Birth, growth, death, decay. <clears throat> when I first built my slaughter plant in uh, 07, 2007, we literally threw away, we composted, threw away a lot of hearts, livers, kidneys, perfectly merchandisable food, good, wholesome, nutrient dense food. Yeah. But nobody wanted, or we we found markets so for very little. Of it. Yes. <clears throat> Fast forward today, the offal is some of the the most expensive cuts of meat we sell because of demand. Yeah. Uh, we uh, 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 things like testicles are, are reserved for our males. We have a like a pro- loyalty program, uh, males. Councilmen and uh, citizens, or something. I don't do that, but we, we, uh, the the testicles and some of these other organs are so precious that yeah. they're reserved. You, know, you got to have that status to order. Right. Right. Nobody, nobody want testicles. You know, uh, <laughs> I, I was raised. I was raised. We, you know, we cowboy. We, we were raised in it, but uh, do you eat them now. Do you eat them now? Testicles. You know, I, I can't afford them now. <laughs> I have to sell them. I love them. I love to, uh, but I have to sell them to people that will pay more for them. And I, I think, I think the testicle may be the most expensive cut of uh, meat we sell on per ounce basis. Wow, that's fascinating. But I believe I'm right about that. Yeah. When you, when well, let's talk a little bit about cost, because one of the objections you get to people buying regenerative meat is the cost, right? They complain about. You know, it's too expensive, and I always talk about well, what you're paying for is nutrient density. Like you don't, you don't need a, like as much of it, and you're going to get a lot more in your system by eating a little bit of regenerative meat and eating like a shit ton of you know badly farmed meat or nutrient shallow products, whatever. Um, how do you tackle that question of expense? Yeah, uh, so several ways because it is a, a, a frequently asked question, and, and there's a lot of different approaches you can take to it. The, the, the main, uh, maybe not the most palatable, but the, the most justifiable is what I said earlier about those unintended consequences that are huge costs that are externalized. When you, when you show up at the counter and buy the pound of hamburger meat or the chicken, you didn't pay those externalized costs that went to produce it. 
the, the damage and the horrible ecological damage or the animal welfare damage and all the other thing. Uh, the, the way to, uh, so that, that's, that's the justification. The explanation is uh, technology has given farmers all these tools, this arsenal of tools that take cost out of production. And when the farmer is asked or chooses to not use these tools, they add cost back to production. Uh, and it's hard, it's hard, it's hard for consumers to understand because in, in the case of my grass-fed beef, it probably cost about 30% more than industrial beef. That I don't know that number's right. This is close. Yeah. yeah. You told me 25, 35, I, I wouldn't argue with you. But in the case of chicken, I can tell you it cost us nearly five dollars a pound to put a non-grain, non-corn, non-soy, step five plus chicken in a bag in Bluffton, Georgia. That'd be a four-pound chicken is, is uh, cost me twenty bucks. I, I need to sell twenty five. Right. You can buy chicken for a dollar a pound. I mean, it's chicken's cheap. Yeah. So the different species lent themselves to industrialization differently. And chicken, it just took enormous cost out of production. Yeah. Cattle yeah. far less cost. And hogs and sheep and goats would be in, in that spectrum. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I also, well, I, I argue those points. I don't argue about health and nutrient density. You made the point about the nutrient density, and I agree with you, but I'm a farmer, you know, and I, I don't know about nutrient density. Uh, health, you know, I, you know I'm, I'm a farmer. I, I, I sound stupid talking about omega 3s and omega 6s and conjugated with omega I, but there are other people that talk about it for me, people like you, people like. Donald Rogers and Rob Wolf. And yeah. Well, one thing, you know, we talk about a lot is obviously preventative stuff, right? I mean, obviously society now is, you know, we're always prescribing the cure instead of like prescribing the preventative. So, you know, obviously in my line of work, it's like, let's stay fit, let's stay healthy and let's eat good food so that we don't get sick um, as opposed to just like getting sick and then finding the right medication. So for me, the food part is a huge part of it, right? If I'm getting, you know, all my vitamins, minerals, and nutrients that I need from really good food, and I'm exercising regularly, and I'm getting enough sleep, and you know, I'm watching my alcohol consumption, that kind of stuff, you know, it's it's a healthy preventative measure to not get sick because the cost of getting sick costs a lot more than the cost of eating good food. You know, and that's and that's there's a similarity there between health and and. and managing managing your health and managing an ecosystem right when i was uh in farming industrially uh, i used all the sides we talked about but briefly yeah. earlier you know side cid is latin for kill, for death kill you know like yeah herbicide kills plants homicide kills people uh, fungicide kills fun right? yeah yeah and the way i farm is I looked for a symptom in my crop that I didn't that I didn't like, and I put something on it to kill it, kill that insect, kill that fungus, kill that nematode, kill that competing plant, and and that's wrong. That's not that's that is not that's breaking the cycles of nature, mm -hmm. and it's not w working with nature to create the abundance, which is what I do now. Right. And what you just described with human health, I think is the same. You know, we, uh, what, 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 I, what I'm out of my, can I give you to kill this symptom as opposed to, well, why does this symptom exist? Right. You know? Yeah. And so exactly. that, that, uh, that's been a big change for me. There's a lot of, there are a lot of similarities in the pharmaceutical industry and the pesticide. They're often at the same company. Right. Yeah. You know, my, my dad my dad used to talk about uh, the way to make money is sell bullets and bandages, right? You, right. You sell the problem, you sell the cure. Yeah. And it's not lost on me that uh, Bayer and Monsanto are the same company. You know, the right. folks that make Roundup are the folks that make Bayer Aspen. So 
the bullets and bandages from the same company. It's a hell of a deal. And I think they're doing pretty good financially. I think they're doing pretty good. You want to talk about carbon a little bit? Because the carbon question always comes up. And I know White Oak Pastures is not only carbon neutral, but carbon negative, right? Our farm is carbon negative. We, uh, a study was done here that shows that we sequester 3.5 pounds of carbon dioxide equivalent for every pound of grass-fed beef we sell. That's on our website, uh, whiteoakpastures.com, under the environmental stewardship section, if you want to look at it. It's a company called Quantus did it. So that that empowers me to believe what I knew intuitively. Yeah. <laughs> intuitively. Is that that we are sequestering carbon? I, I knew that, I and mean, I could tell you with a shovel. I didn't need a scientific study. I, I couldn't quantify it, but I knew it was happening. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, I I don't think it's an accident that people are being whipped up into a frenzy about the carbon cycle. Uh, I think that the broken carbon cycle is horrible. And we need to do something. We need to, we need to fix it. Yeah. I don't think it's any more important than the water cycle or the mineral cycle or the microbial cycle. They all got to work. It's not the best two out of three or four out of five. All of them got to work. But all we hear about is, car- is carbon. Right. And I think that that is because I think it's an intentional uh, public relation campaign. Because I think there's technology out there that will solve the carbon problem uh, on the surface. I mean, it'll, it'll bring the carbon down. It won't put it where it's supposed to be, which is out in, in the soil. But it'll bring it down. And when people get whipped up enough that companies, emitters like uh, uh, Delta Airlines, people like that, start paying a lot of money for carbon drawdown, a lot of technology companies will say, "I got just the thing for you." Right, right. But a lot of money, will, a lot of money will change hands to pull carbon out of the air, but that's really not what needs to happen. I mean, that's that's just part of it. You know, the carbon doesn't need pulling out of the air and pumping into a cave or pulling out of the air and putting an ingot that's stored in a warehouse. The carbon needs to naturally cycle. You know, car- carbon, you know, we, we're starting to think of carbon as being evil. You know, back on that cigarette, uh, you know, it's evil, you know, cigarettes are evil, you know, the key. Carbon is evil, the key. Carbon is a freaking element on the periodic chart. Your body is mostly carbon. It's not water, it's mostly carbon. Right. Carbon is meant to be here. It's meant to cycle. And uh, uh, we're just talking way too much about it. We, we, <clears throat> that's a symptom. We need to fix the problem. <laughs> yeah. But the, pro- the problem is that People look for the problems in a way that makes them more money, right? So let's look at the electric car industry. If as much like money and research and support went into regenerative farming as it did into the electrical car industry, like the problem would be hard, but there's more money in electric cars, right? So the industries go wherever the money, wherever the most profit to be made is, as opposed to, you know, what, what actually solves the problem or what the best way to solve the problem is. So, you know, I say that uh, science is the new religion. You know, people got tired of going to church. Now, now we, we, we worship science. Right. Technology is the collection plate. The technology that, we, that, that science sells us is a collection plate. That's how they monetize. And, and look, look what incredible, incredibly wealthy entities have been developed through selling, to, passing that, that, Collection plate, which is selling the technology. Yeah. And, the, and, the, and the, 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 the high priests of science and technology are the technocrats, and we worship them. And we worship them. We know, you know, I don't, but most people know exactly what Elon Musk and Bill Gates and Zabo and, and the boys are doing. I mean, that, you know, they, uh, they, they are. are they're there, they're in as revealed a, a, a position as anybody on the planet, and and they they collect and they, they they rob that collection plate. So they're the richest people on the planet. So 
and, and I think the most the most damaging people on the planet. It's also it's also there's some kind of a weird irony in like, that someone like Bill Gates like developing all this technology and preaching about this and preaching about that and at the same time being the biggest soy farmer in I think the world. Um, doesn't he own the most farm land in America now? I think um, yeah. knowing full well, I mean, you've got to be an idiot not to know the damage that soy farming does on that scale. I mean, there's a fucking weird irony to that. Well, I'll tell you that. So, uh, uh, and I'm not a Bill Gates basher. I'm a technocrat basher. Right. Now, as I spent the first part of this interview telling you, I'm convinced that misapplied technology got us in the shit we're in. Yeah. But we think that technology will get us out. And the, 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 every right. promise is technology, technology, technology. And the practitioners, farmers out here, are waiting on the next technology. And they're spending all they have to own the next technology. And, you know, the old say it is, if all you got is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Yeah. And for people like Bill Gates, who has made, and the rest of those guys I mean. Who have, who have made just an obscene amount of money. Of course, everything, technology is everything. Of course it is. You know, if, you, if you're leading the, the parade, the technology parade, then it's all about technology. Right, right. Why would you go back? In the day, if you were leading the religion parade, it's all about religion. Yeah. Yeah. What are your hopes, as, as you move forward from this point, um, and I won't keep you too much longer, Will, because I know it's uh, it's been a lot. Um, what are your hopes for kind of like farming in North America for the next 10 years? Do you think this kind of message of regenerative farming can spread and, and will spread? Um, or, you know, you know, I, I see you, you're, you're kind of a pioneer, Carrie's kind of a pioneer, and I, I can see this, this movement kind of growing. Do you, are you encouraged by what you see, or are you kind of like, disappointed what you see or do you think you know we're going to see a big change do you think people are going to smarten up to this and really invest in it or do you think it's going to be just a few of us waving this banner and fighting you know buying the giants kind of thing so, you know, <clears throat> this is my little office the one room office and me and my management team meet every week on wednesday at 1 30. And we don't talk about growth. We don't talk about profitability much. We talk about resilience. And that's where our focus is. We, we, we understand that. We know where we want to be. We know how to get there. <clears throat> but to answer your question, uh, we, we don't know whether we are a niche producer that will make our living for the next generation or two or three raising food focused on the land, the animals, the community, or whether we are early innovators changing the way food's producing this game. I don't know which one I am. Yeah, yeah. And it's, and it's, I, I, hope it's, I hope it's the second one, yeah. but it's, it's likely the first one. I just don't know. Right. I, I, see, a lot, I see a lot of people do, that do. You're right. There are not many of us. Carrie, me, I can name 20 others probably. I don't know them all. Uh, but uh, I see a lot of unhappy people because they're they're focused on changing the world, and and, and they they're smart enough to know they may not be able to do that. I am a obscene, just deliriously happy guy because my focus is not saving the world. My focus is on saving white oak pastures. Yeah. Now I hope I'm and I'm willing to share. What I've learned over the last 25 years to help save the world. That's not my mission. Right. We, we formed a, a nonprofit last year. Um, you know, I, I funded it, uh, 501c3, called Center for Agricultural Resilience, to help people who want to farm differently or want to eat differently understand it and mm -hmm. come here. It's not, it's not a how to farm session. It's a how to think about the food production system different session. And That's I was happy to fund it. I'm happy to, to teach at it. I, I, I participate in that. But my goal is save white oak pastures. My goal is not save the world. Now, the center is my contribution towards saving the world. 
and I hope it gets right. Help him, help him save the world. If he save the world, help him save the world. But I, and I hope he gets traction. But that I don't live and die by that. I live and die by making this land. And I, I didn't tell you, but I, there's, I got 180 employees, and uh, and they are my family, and uh, that's my goal. Yeah. Well, and also like. The solution, obviously, is not for white oak, pastures, white oak pastures to supply North America with food. The solution is to have more farms like white oak pastures, right? So, you know, like you're saying, it really just takes education and, and knowledge and, and, and spreading that um, because, you know, like I said, you can't you can't solve this problem on your own. You're not gonna you're not gonna change the world with one farm. It's gonna take a thousand farms, you know. And, and that's entirely possible because what we do here. Is highly replicatable. Right. It's not highly scalable. You know, white oak pastures won't be competing with Tyson and Smithfield and right. Indy, you know, it's not that kind of model. That is a, as we said earlier, a very linear, scalable model. This is a very uh, uh, cyclical and replicatable model. You can have one or two or three in every ag county in the nation. And and we feed our own communities. You know, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't want to compete with carry shipping beef to California. No, exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I, it's funny the way that you talk about it. It's kind of like the way I I feel about the gyms that we build because they're all community based gyms. They're not like Lobo gyms. They're not like gyms with thousands of members. Because when you get to that point, you've kind of lost connection with people. You've lost kind of like the central kind of family feel with it. The kind of like um. You know your your infrastructure. Your you you know all your employees, right? You know everyone that works for you. You know like a lot of the, a lot of the community that you serve food to. You know personally. Um, as soon as you get to something on that bigger scale, you lose something. You lose that that relationship. Um, and that's how I feel about like our gyms. Better to have you know multiple gyms with smaller communities and these huge like facilities with thousands of people that, where no one knows each other. Um, because you lose something when you get to that scale. And that's the problem with centralized industry in general. Like when it gets to that scale, it's all just a numbers game. And it's no longer about relationships and it's no longer about connection. It's just about numbers. So I feel the way about much in the way that you feel about your your farm and the way that you do things. Um, but again, um, well, I just want to thank you, man. Like it's fucking great to talk to you. I love what you guys are doing. If I can ever help in any way with what you're doing, let's bring a message. Please reach out because I'm more than happy to do. So I'll keep working with Carrie, trying to spread her, her uh, message and her products. Uh, I had a beef liver this morning. It was fucking sensational. Uh, <laughs> trying to eat that most days. Um, anything else you want to add, Will, before we uh, sign off? No, my daughter would, would uh, fuss at me if I didn't mention that. Uh... We have sold the book rights to White Oak Pastures, uh, to, uh, uh, Penguin Viking publisher bought it, and uh, it's, it's uh, it'll, be, it'll be it'll be coming out next year in, in 23. It's called A Bold Return to Giving a Damn. Oh, I and, saw this on the website. Yeah, that's a book. Uh, yeah, that, that, well, it will be. Uh, the, the the term "bold return to giving a damn" is something we've just said for a long time. And the uh, publisher chose to name the book that, which is kind of nice and kind of organic. You know, like it's not a bunch of slick people sitting around for what we ought to call it. It was you know, the, the name came from here. That's awesome. Well, you can tell your daughter that I'm going to get, I'm going to buy a bunch, and I'm going to get a bunch of stores in the Idle World to buy a bunch, and I'll buy some for LA, and we'll we'll buy a bunch and we'll sell them through everyone that I know. Well, you know, I'm not. It's like everybody else. So I'm not. If if everybody on the planet gets three copies, we're still not going to make a lot of money. I just want the word out there. It's just, it's, like I said, it, yeah, it's education. It's education. I want it out there because, you know, again, my, my goal is not to save the planet, but my contribution towards saving the planet is to teach, is to tell people what we've learned in 25 years. We, you know, not, when we started 25 years ago, the, the, we talk about not many people doing it now. There damn sure weren't many people doing it 25 years ago. Right, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, and it's it's like you said, it's come full circle. It's gone from, you know, pre-World War II, everything we did before that, 
we've gone through that whole thing post-World War II. We've come full circle now. And then hopefully with your help and Carrie's help and the education all the stuff, hopefully people will start returning to the way that it used to be done because we know it's better for the planet. It's better for nature. That's the cycle of life. Um, better for animal welfare, better for the health of human beings, better for the planet, better for everybody. So hopefully we'll find a way back there. Um, again, thank you, Will, but uh, you're an amazing man. Uh, you're doing an amazing uh, job, amazing things. And um, I hope that we can connect in the future. And I hope one day I get to come to Bluffton, Georgia and stay with you guys and check it out. Make it out. I'm, I'm, I'm a lot better than showing you than I am telling you. Come, come I love it. Yeah. I'll thank, get you. thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. Of course. Well, thank you again, brother. Appreciate it. Guys, thanks so much for listening. Um, we have a new gym in uh, Idlewild, Press Athletic Club Idlewild, uh, of course, as well as our gym in LA, uh, Press Athletic Club. Come check us out. Keep listening to the podcast. Let me know your thoughts. Please follow. Please follow the YouTube channel. And um, let's, let's keep spreading uh, the good stuff. And uh, I'll catch you guys soon. Take care. Thanks again, Well, Thank you. Thank you, brother.